Good evening, morning, afternoon, whatever applies to you. And welcome back to EuroLeague, where we are saying goodbye to the regular season. We are also saying goodbye to a couple of truly awful slash disappointing teams, let's say. Uh, we are also saying hello to the Blood Money World Cup, but don't worry, we're not going to be super centric on that today. More sort of, you know, framing from a LEC holistic European viewpoint and you know as much as I'd like to pretend it doesn't exist at all if Fnatic win we're not gonna pretend it didn't happen and not factor that into playoffs so it is what it is guys uh, what I will say is for very obvious reasons uh, this video is demonetized which should mean that you don't get any ads which you know will be nice if you do take it up with YouTube because I don't have anything to do with that. It's got nothing to do with me. So it is what it is, but I don't think you will. Anyway, I am joined as always by Mr. Kira and Hang Zoe or Zoe from Attack on Titan. Or is Hong Zhu? I mean, this could be, I don't know. It's spelled Hang Zoe from a English person's pov. So, you know, I think it's not a bad one to be fair. I think the, uh, I thought it was uh, a Dynasty Warriors character at one point there. But then, uh... Hang, Hung Zong enjoyers. Oh, yet? yeah. You, you, I see you're really hitting again, like, the, the just, like, complete nebulous gender characters at this point. <laughs> I think it's so, like, I, I, ne I watched the first season of Attack on Titan, and, like, I understand why people enjoyed that show, because it is one of those shows which has really good... Um, animation yeah. and soundtracks, and the character designs are very engaging. Um... However, it does feel like that kind of draws you in, like like so many other things of the area. I think Sword Art Online did that, where it's just like people get people think that the soundtrack's great, it, and the characters are so great. It's so cool. They... Any character could die at any moment, Nymira. It's just like Game of Thrones. Mm. So cool. Yeah, yeah, and and also like some bits of Game of Thrones. My problem with Attack on Titan for the grand majority is the pacing is fucking awful. Like I I like bits and pieces of it, but then you like you have like breakneck first three episodes, and then there's basically nothing for the next. I don't know, handful. And then it kind of goes breakneck again, like at random points. And it makes it really hard to, um, like, be engaged in the way that it wants you to be. And it just completely runs through some, like, really important stuff really quickly. I, I don't know. I, I understand why people liked it, but I dropped it after one season because I realized I'd be hate watching it beyond that point because it was just so popular. I didn't want to have to engage with that fandom at the peak of its popularity because I watched it while it was airing. And uh, I'm kind of glad that I didn't um, carry they on. They got the ending they deserved. There is something. There will to be that. no spoilers on this show, Mr. Kira. Although you can't stop me. Yeah, true. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess I, I, I could. I could literally could just edit stop you. recording. I could literally edit you out. But yeah, sure. Uh, I don't. To be I'll, fair, I'll I don't find mind. A way. I don't mind if you spoil it for me because I'm not going to watch that shit anyway. I watched the first season also. I believe I gave it a three. Although you can see, oh no, you can't see on my anime list because that oh, is not I can because I know what it is. But you it, can't. <laughs> it either got a three or a four. I wish you, again. I wish you could give points, uh, decimal point scores on that because I just think, that, yeah, not not enough uh, variation for me. But anyway, yeah, uh, to me, I just got sick of the whole horrors of war thing that they just overplayed like with every single character ten times an episode. And I was like, this. Is uh, just also, boring. all of the main characters are shit. For, like, the, the, I think it gets better apparently when they focus uh, they switch the focus onto different characters. But like, the main trio of characters. I just don't care about them. They're so I've, bland. They're I've so realised <laughs> at this point, Nymera, that whenever anyone says an anime gets better, it's just this like bigger picture globalist psyops to try and bait people into consuming more anime because I don't believe that it's true. I think it's, yeah. This it's... is how I ended up watching no, five hundred there, episodes of Gintama. Yeah. <laughs> what do you call Jim? I, I'm not gonna lie. Okay, like it's not worth it. Right? It isn't worth it. Do not. I am not saying it's worth it. The Maroon Ford arc of One Piece is the best arc, but it is like three hundred. I only watched One in. Piece on Toonami growing up. So, that right, was, but it is like three hundred. Yeah. Like I think or all the that's the problem. Or the problem is right. when but, I watch shit thing, like Dragon Ball Z and One Piece. Like I remember, like this one episode of Zoro getting lost in like a snowy mountain and Dragon Ball. I remember watching like the Boo fight like a dozen times and never knowing how it ended because I'd catch the wrong days for the episodes and I couldn't fi finish Ooh. the goddamn show. This is how I get all of these shows which were on like actual TV stations for me growing up. I have the weirdest timelines where I'm like, hey, I remember this episode at some point. I can't remember the fucking flow of it That happened to me with Shaman King, by the way. I, I never right, knew how right. it ended for years. And then I went back and watched Dragon Ball during an exam season, which I didn't really want to study for. And I watched all of it within like a week. <laughs> nice. 
redefining the word cramming. Good job. Uh, yep. Yeah, I do not do not believe that it's possible to have an arc that is good, that lasts three to five hundred episodes. People complain, or not so much anymore, people used to complain about before the movies came out, like, why would I read Lord of the Rings? That book's like a thousand pages long. Well, first of all, a thousand pages is nothing compared to some of these fucking <clears throat> anime journeys that you're forced to go on to get anything out of it. And secondly... Actually, the reason why that book is so fucking long is because Tolkien, as a writer, was so obsessed with his own world that he just like would. He randomly... didn't want to be a writer. He didn't want well, to be a writer. Yeah. He, he wanted to be like he wanted to be a linguistics historian because that's and it that. Shows. And, but 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 he wasn't allowed to do that. That's not the course he was accepted into Oxford for. <laughs> so what he ended up doing was taking a creative writer or like lit or whatever it was or creative writing or whatever it was. Um. And he effectively just used the Lord of the Rings as a as a vector for him to just do language an excuse like linguistic history anyway. And by the way, there's some really fun bits on this because he was he was he, you know he designed several languages for the Lord of the Rings, and it's incredible work the way he did it. His proofreader for the first ma uh, manuscript of Lord of the Rings caught him out on a typo in Dwarvish on the front cover of, uh, like, the first page of the book. So there is, like, a brief moment where there's, like, there's a typo in Dwarven, Dwarvish, like, on, the f on, like, the cover page, effectively. Like, it, it was so up to the nines in regards to, like, language. But yeah, like, I mean, again, stuff. spoiler, that's the reason why the books are so long, is because he'll just go down random tangents of, like, getting the, so ingratiated the, in his own world The first world chapter building. is just talking about the different communities of hobbits. Not not anything to do with the story. It's just talking about hey, all of the, like, yeah. Within the first two, the I hobbits. think it's the first chapter, there is unironically, hobbits, yeah. yeah, there's unironically a, I don't even know how many pages it goes on for, where it's talking about the inside of a hobbit home. And it then says, and inside this hobbit home was a bookshelf. And on this bookshelf was a book. And next to this book was another book. And that book was... Yep. Called, and it literally like goes down this crazy like three-page tangent. I'm like, what am I fucking reading? It kind uh, of reads like Deuteronomy, where it's just like all of these people who is like this person, son of this person, son of this person. Yeah. Like, a couple of pages. <laughs> yeah. He enjoyed his own creation, I think it is fair to say. Uh, anyway, uh, I do have a patented would you rather, as always, uh, this week, guys. It's a bit dark, I'm not going to lie. It's a bit dark, but hey. Uh, Compared whatever. to what we've had recently? <laughs> I can't remember. I in, in one ear or in one eyeball out the other for me, Nightmare, when I come up with these. So I, don't, <laughs> I don't even remember the most recent ones. But anyway, this one's quite dark by any metric. Anyway, there is a house fire. Would you save, and you can only save one of these two options, your newly wedded wife slash soulmate, whatever, not just some, you know, Vegas bimbo that you've made a mistake with, or in the other room, your two newly born twins? You can only save one. Or I guess in the twins I'm case. Not really the I'm not really the person to ask this. So. <laughs> Why not? I mean, I, I do believe that none of us have children, so this is the, uh, you know... Perfect yeah, question. The problem with this is that so I've that's never that's really... That's what I'm saying. Uh, like, when you call this all... It's a, it's, it's... it's a hypothetical, Kira. These people do I, not I exist. Have... The fire... You don't need to have nightmares about know. the fire tonight, mate. It's not real, okay? Yeah, I, a... I, I don't particularly want kids, so that's... I, okay, but that's that's a pretty dark way to get rid of them <laughs> if you don't want them. God. <sighs> oh, shit. Uh, the thing is, like... Um, uh, pfft, yeah, that... Oh god. I'm loving this by the way. Yeah, already. This, is... this is brilliant. The, the, first the, first you like... put the pigs on us, and now you're giving us like oh my god. No, but Jesus, this is like man. the trolley problem for me where I just yeah. give you like see when you asked me the one about the shopping, you know, that really yeah. got like my juices going. Oh yeah, like, the oh, yeah. shopping thing. Like, yeah, that oh, he doesn't give a fuck about the pigs. <laughs> he wants you <laughs> to right? the shopping then, which matters. But now <laughs> this one here is just so laissez faire, you're just like, oh whatever. It's like did I get the kids? Did I not leave them both in? <laughs> like, uh, it is, like, look, lock the door. What do you call it? Leave no doubts, you know? Make sure. Like, it's, I'm pretty sure it's a... How, it's how three, did you play The Sims as a kid? How many stairs out of the pool yeah. did you remove in The Sims? <laughs> Three plus five. Why was the members? fridge the walled off, Gera? That breaks the ceiling and the insurance claim amount, you know? I did just find it. I just, just, I had a video on my TikTok for you page recently, which is just a person basically making an art prison in Sims, where you give like the bare necessities for like a bunch of people to keep making artwork to fund, fund lavish lifestyles that, for the people you actually want to build a house for nice. upstairs. Did I marry? Did I marry my wife? Yeah, sure. 
Well, then it's my wife, you know, because I actually made a vow to God, you know. To God himself. No, you're eye rolling. You're, no, no, you're no, no, eye rolling. No, 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 it's, no, no, no that, that's more like I'm just like, a, it's some logic. I there get we go. it. <laughs> I made a vow to God himself that, um, you know what I mean, that okay. I protect her. We can, we can have more kids. There you go. What's he protecting Un you from, Kira? Anything specific you could list off here? God. Yeah, what's he protected you from? He just doesn't need to protect you from interest. anything. No, no, no. It's a, it's a one, it's a one-sided vow. And not all, not. It doesn't have to be a two-way street. It's right. in service. Okay. Service on gratitude. Okay. So I think, in a purely pragmatic sense, like if I was a single parent bringing up two kids, that would fucking ruin me. Ooh, um, okay, like, interesting. So, angle, so, because, yeah. so, yeah, bringing up two newborn kids, I'm, and, you know, like I'm, I'm lucky to have a very supportive family, but even then, like. I'm pretty sure my life would go to shit if I had to be a single parent. Well, being a grieving single parent of two kids from a horrific incident, that would be pretty awful. And don't get me wrong, losing two kids in a fire would also be pretty horrific, but I would still be able to take care of myself at least. Um, I'm like, put it this way. I think there's like an inevitability of like a lot of people answering this question. Not inevitability, but there's a significant like percentage that if you, if you choose to save your kids, like they're going to end up in foster homes or your life's going to shit or, or and it, basically everyone involved is going to have like a real downturn in their life because you just don't have the resources to like fund fund a two kid lifestyle basically as a single parent so i think yeah one i I've, i i don't particularly want to have kids and two i just think that my life would be just that would that would be like the nosedive in my life yeah. if that happened just on a mental and then also just a economic level as well so i'd probably save my spouse at that point See, what's, I think what's interesting about this question, right, is I'm pretty sure if you were to poll, let's say, Americans, that they would overwhelmingly vote to save the two babies than they would mm. the spouse. Because obviously, not going to get too political about this, but there's all this stuff of abortion and blah, blah, blah. Like They believe that a fucking two cells is worth mm. the life of a mother. So they've got a, like a different uh, approach to this anyway, let's say. Um, but to me as well, I mean, all of the logic, like the practical logical points that you made, I would co-sign. But I would also just say as well, you know, this person, the, your your partner, this your mm. your life partner in this one, like you know them, you have known them. They have developed into the, whoever the person is that they have. They have all their own independent thoughts, whatever they've lived a life and have experienced. They can experience being burned alive or whatever on a level which I think even like a new if it's a newborn baby yes the tragedy is that their life gets cut short before they've even had like a chance to live it or whatever but i don't i don't assign the same amount of value to potential as i do to someone who like fully exists in my uh in my opinion and by the way again i understand this ever perpetual idea of like all lives are equal blah blah and i think as a general sentiment that's a good sentiment to have right but if we're actually getting down to the nitty gritty, things like the frontal lobe don't even develop until you're 25. I'm not saying that means a 22 year old's life should be less. I'm just saying that a baby, it's like, it is kind of like, this is like a, the baby's a fish argument. I've heard this yeah, argument. The baby is a fish. It's the baby. Uh, that's obviously, obviously that goes too far, but just when weighed up against the life of so, a fully fledged human who has relationships, who has inner mm. circles, outer circles, work life relationships or whatever, I do think that is worth more than the putty that can be all of those things, but is not yet. No, it's the word that they have to use there, Mira. This guy should work in spin. Mate, you know? it's, it's <laughs> the like, biological. Yeah, thank, thank God the it's biological in out one, it, one eye, <laughs> out the other ear oh, for this yeah, guy when Oliver it comes to the questions. I'll have forgotten all, all of this by next week. Don't even worry. I, but no, I, I they, to me, though, they are like, just sentient what, plants I, with eyes and cry but, but but like the the problem when it comes to this kind of question, when it comes to like literally life or death, saving could like split second decision like that. Let's be honest, you can't really sit and analyze that in the moment. I think a lot of people would. I think a lot of people would very much go and save the kids just based on just in the moment. That's what what they would think. Well, because they're helpless yeah. as well. In in, yeah, rea exactly. in reality, you you might yeah, think, so like, oh, Chino's you know, house I, I can, is on fire, so you know, I, I, she's yeah. got a chance. Yeah, that, well, that, and also, that's, yeah. That, that's true, actually. That's and also, point. I think I think just in general, like, yeah, if you're in the heat of the moment, I'm, I'm not going to sit there and analyse it. I, I, heat I, I, of the moment. Like, <laughs> yeah, oh, shut up. I mean, as long, yeah, you know, I, I can sit and say whatever now. I, I can't tell what I would do in the moment like that, though, because, yeah, I don't know, that's just all down to adrenaline and situational decision-making, I guess. No, no, realistically, I think you would go and 
and grab the kids because you would just you just shout to the wife, get the hell yeah. out of the house, and then mm. you just go and dry grab the kids. But yeah, if it is a pure hypothetical where for whatever reason you know that you can only save mm. one or the other and it's a conscious choice, then yeah, I would pick the partner uh, every time. Uh, but anyway, moving on from that lovely little uh, hypothetical onto uh, League of Legends, which was equally as dark, uh, in my opinion, in terms of the gameplay that I had to watch. No, it's actually uh, darker. Is it? It's real. True. Yeah, it's actually happened. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> True. No, there's no hypotheticals here. Yeah. It's actually going to happen. <laughs> LEC regular season games are, in fact, higher stakes than uh, saving newborn twins. Uh, but yeah, anyway. Yeah, millions way, of people have to watch this, you know, over time. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> true. By the way, speaking of, you know, the ultimate dystopia, uh, I think you both of you have touched on this, maybe not on the show or whatever, but I do hate this new extra week thing. I fucking hate it. Like... The, anyway, for people who don't know, basically it was three weeks regular season. It's now four weeks regular season to quote unquote, give teams more time to prepare or whatever, which of course in actuality, yes, it does do that technically. But as Markoon said in a hilarious interview, well, you know, we practiced more and we got a bit better, but so did the other teams. So we didn't close the cap. It's like, yeah, that's how it works. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Like, hang on, hang on now. In defense of Markoon, I think in that interview was pretty raw thing. I'd like... He wasn't saying it's against sense of like other teams don't improve. It's just like, I don't know, very raw feelings. And it's like, well, oh, no, I, yeah. I, I get that feeling of like real kind of like just really digging through the mire of like every time you think you make an improvement, you're not improving enough. Like that's really hard actually in that kind of team environment. Oh no, I don't get me wrong. Yeah. Like, I, I don't think it was like, in of itself yeah. a really stupid comment it was just kind of such okay a... the optics of it are really yeah, kind of funny it's yeah, like but... <laughs> but yeah this is this is the thing like everyone has equal opportunity to be good or bad like it's the same for everyone is the point yeah and it's mm. always going yeah, to yeah. be the same for everyone yes absolutely so yeah i hate that i think that the extra week kind of derailed the hype i think the fact that so much can happen and twist and turn in the final week um when it's three weeks which by the way out of pure chance it did this time as well because we had like ludicrous amounts of teams with tiebreakers and so on but i don't know i just wasn't a big fan overall by the way i'm hearing I, we speculated about this last time i um suggested that i thought the viewership overall would probably have gone down for this split in part because of the sort of slightly drawn out structure apparently it's 29 percent up but um, I. But this is compared to summer last year when they yes. had no Carmen Core and no. Well, Ebay yeah. was there, but no, no, no Kometo really, and exactly. Ebay was less involved with the co-streaming. So yeah, it's. Well, it, no, he I... wasn't co-streaming last year. It yeah, did he, help yeah. that Mad Lions played all those extra games that were like do or die. Well, yeah, yeah. sure, but I mean, it, I to me, yeah, as Nightmare just, I think this is just co-stream diff. Like, I don't actually think. And by the way, they shouldn't... I think it is a bit cheeky. Obviously, now the the future of esports seems to be going down this co-streaming route. That's going to be something that's always going to be there. And they will, will... I don't think they should actually count those stats in the same way that they... Like, let's put it this way. All the mm. all of the advertisers or whatever shouldn't bloody count it the same. Because these co-streamers... That's the only thing which matters. Yeah, like exactly. Exactly. And these co-streamers are, like, talking over all the ads. They're so, like, they might get a different screen up while the ads are on. And, like, you know, Cajal likes to get his paint up and draw some things and do, like, analyze pit band during breaks and stuff like this. Like, I think these stats are pretty misleading when it comes to the really important metrics of, as Nymera says, like, what's actually going to keep the leagues going. Um, although... At this rate, let's be honest, probably Saudi interventionism is going to be what keeps the leagues going. But let's pretend that doesn't exist for a second. Uh, so, yeah, I'm overall not a fan. I would like to see it go back to the three weeks. Um, um, yeah, go on. On that note, in terms of viewership, because um, I think I saw a comment on this Reddit, on Reddit, which I found quite interesting, which because there were some, some threads about this in regards to, like, I'm kind of surprised that on um, there isn't a somebody out there trying to do like effectively split on split user opinion surveys, effectively with your opinion surveys, because like there is basically nothing out there in regards to um, like actual like um, and it, I, I know it's weak and again like the the view the, 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 like whatever there's a lot of stuff which can go wrong with that, but I'm surprised there hasn't been at least an attempt at trying to say okay well split on split what's gone well what's gone poorly rather than just hand waving and saying oh it's better or worse or whatever. Like, having, like, a viewer opinion survey with a decent enough sample size would still be useful and interesting to see, even if there's some easy kind of, like, noise going into that. Kind of surprised we haven't had anything I, like that. I'm going to say one thing about esports viewers. 
One, they actually don't know what they want, right? Okay, and most of them lie about what they actually want. That is Historically, true. right? I have been around in esports terms. I am a dinosaur. I have watched almost every single big esports that anyone would consider. Yes, but this like, would big. be a way to show them that they don't know what they know if they no, say no, no, that because... we want this, and then it ends up being a negative response. And the next time they do the survey or whatever. But here's the other one. Two, they all lie. The amount of esports that like viewers are like. Long term, like viewers that like do actually want, they all actually like lie about the the thing that they want, and then the actual uh, way that they the they do watch it. If you know what I mean. Um. So, this and then the a, reason that yeah, you can this is the anyway. thing. No, this is the thing though, because in esports e is unique in the sense that fans, individual fans, do actually have a voice. Because if you go on like football Reddit or whatever, it's like it's so. First of all. 99% of football fans do not use Reddit. And the ones that do, the sport is so popular that it's still going to be drowned in a 10,000 mm -hmm. comment thread. Esports is actually unique that it's kind of like the perfect size that fans can actually... Like, people recognize each other's accounts and stuff on Reddit. And people will make comments and try and be consistent with those comments or whatever. And they are worried about their own individual reputation, as Kira says, when it comes to this kind of stuff. And they will pretend that they love best of fives when actually they're just a pleb who wants to just, like, you know, have yes. ADHD and wants to watch yes. every single BO1. Uh -huh. And Riot even proved that, by the way, that this is a complete fallacy. Like, they actually did prove this and they broke it down for us in, like, an owner's meeting once that these people were just lying where this this is the one time they did do a survey it was the, after the drop-off in viewers yeah the monstrosity mm -hmm. that was best of twos if you remember that split um oh, they did that a, was the problem where they had the mult they had multiple streams running at the same time which was just not it they yeah. had like ulcs one and ulcs two yes but they did a focus group thing which was also based off uh LCS, which had not changed its format at the time, and they asked people like what they liked and didn't like or whatever but across BO ones, twos, and threes, and basically the data completely contradicted with the answers that these people yep. had given. And then 100%. they, and this is when they did the famous thing of like bringing up the board where it had MLB on one end, which has like 180 regular season games, whatever it is, mm. and WWE on the other end. And the point being like entertainment versus competitive integrity. And they were like, the reality is people want to be here. And they've moved the needle like all the way towards WWE, but they're pretending that they want to be here and like moved it back to like MLB. And that is actually a truism. Um, but to Nymera's point, I still like this idea because I think what you have to do is you do it split by split. This was just one thing that they did after they had a whole body of data over like mm. six seasons or whatever. If you do it split by split, you can actually get people to give useful feedback because then it becomes a yes. part of like, I recognize this, but these are the things I did actively did not like. And then you can trim that off or add it or whatever. And then you can directly see the impact of that, the following split. It can't be a yearly review. That Then there'll, there'll, yeah. there'll be too many things muddied. But I do actually think Nymera is right that if you do it split on split, you will eventually end up with the perfect format of integrity versus entertainment. And, and because because the problem with esports in terms of like entertainment products is in terms of broadcast and stuff like that um there is basically very very little usable material to have either in terms of data or academia to have any kind of underpinning to a lot of conversations which could happen and it's not always going to be useful and it sometimes takes a long time for that to to come through typically when it comes to kind of doing academia and like doing big studies and stuff um a lot of that happens you know multiple decades into um a scene's lifespan hell i i, I even remember helping out a phd student last year or the year before on a study they were doing on esports and one of the things that they were saying there was that hey this is really quite quick into esports to be getting these kind of studies but i really feel like there is a real um like dearth of user memo material in terms of like well okay we have seen this working in xyz scenarios or not working and just at least having some kind of bedrock or foundation for it to build off of later even if it's not usable now it may become usable later and if you're doing surveys split on split for like user reviews or whatever uh, it might not be usable for a while and it might you might even use it just to say this doesn't work but you need to do something otherwise you're leaving like this really kind of like um untapped resource i feel like and just the fact that no one's doing anything like that i feel like is a bit of a missed opportunity because particularly as we're going through such large changes having that data for this moment you're not going to be able to retroactively do that you know yeah by the way small aside because nimera will know this and 
basically everyone in the scene, I think, will know this because these are probably the most common emails slash DM requests or whatever that we get is people who say they're students working on a master's degree or whatever, and they want to interview us or like get data from us because they're using it for a project, blah, blah, blah. Hot tip, guys, if you're going to do this, which by the way, unironically, I'd probably get these like, I don't know, five times a month. If I go on your replies and see that you've added someone like Leviathan and asked them the exact same copy pasting, I'm probably not going to do that. You know, I'm probably not. So I, I would just say... Oh, I, I typically tend to respond. I'm, I'm a softie like that. I do. No, I, so I made a mistake because I actually, I, I usually don't because if I see that they've been spamming it, I yep. won't, especially if it's like, yeah. But I actually responded to one without checking their um, replies uh, beforehand. And then I said, like, yeah, I'll reply to your email. And then I went and looked at the other people they'd asked right. this to because they put it in public tweets. And I was like, yeah, no. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think you're much, for me at least, you're much more likely to get a response if you don't just spam every single human in the scene, including people whose philosophy I totally disagree with, uh, just as a bit of a tip. But anyway, yeah, so go on, Kira. No, just a little, one little point here, right, okay. I, right, okay, was one of the original, like, native, like, LPL viewers who watched it from like its inception, right? And people used to be on Reddit back in the day talking about why is there no Western LPL content? And it, it did exist, by the way. There was a talk show. It has Ross Gurn, Raz, uh, Kelsey, Moser produced it. It's called China Talk, right? It got picked yeah, up by um, a big a broadcast later, later on down the road. But okay, those episodes all still exist. They were never watched. They were never popular, right? That channel has like VODs on it of the old LPL, okay? There are genuine VODs on there, okay? And they are the only VODs of those games that I know that exist in the West that have two views. One of them is me, right? <laughs> so, and then you have people on Reddit claiming to have watched these games. I know you're lying unless you're literally committing identity theft to log into Chinese websites to watch them. Because they're the only other place that has these games or you go on to the... By the, the way, time... I have over a hundred VODs of unbroadcast games of LPL from this year. <laughs> yeah. I can see already people don't watch this shit, really. Yeah, people... People don't watch it, and here's and here's the ultimate like kicker. People were constantly asking, "Where's this content? Where's this content? Where's this content?" Right? And back in the day, when I actually I didn't used to talk on Reddit, I used to just reply to people. I would link them always the time these like talk shows and all that didn't make a difference. Nobody ever really picked up on like the traction of it. It took Dom having a big stream presence and him starting to watch the LPL for the this new Western LPL like native people to like rise up right and then and him these... and cage roll kind of yeah, going and back I... and forth on their favorite teams and stuff yeah and cage roll now with the lck and the lpl and that's what like really like brought it up right in the west but the actual lpl broadcast as fantastic as it was in my opinion for a long 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 time right was not popular yeah. and now it's like in this kind of like weird like middle ground but even then fans like were given the option of like having it and it was like put in their like face. Maybe it wasn't advertised as well as like Riot could off. You know what I mean? It was kind of shunted away the red steady, the red headed stepchild. But my God, it was like a it's a Google search or YouTube away. Like and so like people didn't actually want to watch it. People got more invested in it because their guy like wanted yeah. to watch it. Yeah, I mean that, that. To be fair, it's like a good angle if you're a big streamer and then you sort of make certain teams your favourites and certain teams your fake enemies or whatever, and build a storyline around that. I mean, that's cool for a Western audience. By the way, if you do want to watch some otherwise, I do believe unbroadcasted LPL games, and Nymera uh, streams them on Twitch with his brother. I believe Mondays and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, every Wednesday. single week. Um, um, so yeah, we've. I'm calling them the lost LPL games because it just sounds cooler. But yeah, that, we have. Way, like... what, how do you? Because I remember when you first started doing it, you used to have to like turn the volume way down because it was. like... Oh, we have clean feed now. Now you so, have like, clean there's, feed. There's, so so yeah. clean. Um, co streamers have clean feed now if they want to set it up now. Like when there's the regular broadcast. Like well, like I'm not gonna do this shit while the official broadcast is of on course, because yeah, yeah. I, it's undermining the product. But I'll I'll still sit there and I'll I'll, I'll do like a regular co stream. But yeah, I mean we do camera off co stream for um the non-broadcast games because otherwise they would just get lost to history especially in the west you just like never be able to really watch them again unless like you're trolling through like different different websites and whatever um and yeah we've gotten i got i mean i've cast over i've cast cast about 320 games this year or already just lpl basically i've cast like a couple of things elsewhere but like there's so many freaking games and like about a hundred or so of them are on no way more than a hundred a number of them are on my like they're on youtube they're on twitch and whatever but uh 
Yeah, it turns out it does take a bit of an individual effort to get shit rolling sometimes. Um, so there you go, guys. You don't need to just pretend to watch LPL anymore. You can actually watch it with an English cast uh, if you feel inclined to do so. Uh, so anyway, back to, albeit... The few. Oh, we've delayed uh, talking about you know the the, the 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 thing we're trying to avoid. <laughs> but this is the thing. There's barely any EU games, and I'm still not overly excited to break them down. But here we go. So let's start with Nymera's pick for uh, oh, EU ah, supremacy. Ah, ah, <laughs> it God, is of yeah. course Vitality. Oh. Uh, my God, where to start with this nonsense? I mean. Uh, the thing all, is, all wrong. Yeah, ex that, exactly. The thing is, because, you know, uh, Neg on Nymera or whatever, but the reality is I had them top four. I think Kira had them fourth as well. Did you? Fourth? Yeah, and I think I've even got uh, them high up and, like, sorry on you. Yeah, no, so we all, we're all we really in the same boat here. Uh, Nymera just got the most excited. I'm just, I'm just uh, first off the fucking bow of the ship. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So uh, it's a banger. I mean, the irony is we all talked about what their big weaknesses were uh, and still play some high, but it just turned out that those weaknesses were so unassailably bad that... Yeah, that apparently you missed. You can't even come top eight. You were in the bottom 20% of teams because you're just that bad. So, yeah, it's a banger. Uh, they lost. Um, not only did they obviously lose this week, they then played Mad in a tiebreaker. Mad, who obviously didn't have a very good split, but apparently that was too much for them as well. So, yeah, Nymera, what happened to your boys? What's uh, well, we've had a million different interviews from a million different players now. And, like, I think all of this like sums up pretty nicely Kazi just said we played like shit the whole split they did um we've had people like mac and pad talk about how they really tried to double down on hillasang style of play and get everyone onto the same page but that effectively became impossible after a while they tried to double down on whatever hilly style to play the game is and it just hasn't worked out because of just differences in opinion um, of how to play the game between the players. And Sorry this is stuff... Did they expand on what Helly's style of I can't remember. I think it was... I think that was, was the same, they, I, so I watched it very recently, and they basically reiterated the same things and expanded on it a little bit and basically said, he sees these tiny windows. And this is all predicated on the idea that apparently Hilly is the only human in the West who can oh, like, so actually manage and be aware of every right. single cooldown and the small windows. And they were basically saying stuff like, oh, Hilly identified that this guy's flash was down and that uh, this guy's alt was down and this ward should have exp uh, expired. So there's like a three second window and he has to go for it. And they were sat there, as I like tweeting about, like in awe that this guy had just like deciphered the Rosetta Stone on his own or something and was just, you know, hovering in the air like a Peruvian monk. Like it's insane how brainwashed these people are. By the way, I'm not going to discredit Hilly's whole career and be like, this guy's a fraud. Obviously, Hilly is a cerebral player who has at points in his career been absolutely top tier. Unfortunately, the guy's hands have fallen off. They've fallen off for quite a while and his judgment has either other teams have caught on, cottoned on to it or it's just got worse or I don't know what the comms are like. But by the way, when you say things like there is X window for someone to pull something off and he's the only one that sees it, uh, the other team might have seen it as well, by the way, buddy. Like the idea that like they might even be saying like, oh shit, by the way, I'm vulnerable mid for like the next five seconds because my whatever hasn't, my flash hasn't come back up. So he, maybe he's going to back off the wave and then Hilly's hook lands, but it now lands in a place where he follows the hook through and he's fucking dead on the tower because the other guy predicted that that could be a dangerous moment. Like they are only viewing it through the lens of like, what does this savant see? It's like, mate, there could be three savants in your eyes on the other team. We've all seen it as well, which is why it gets caught all the time. Like how they view the game is mental to me. And unfortunately, they have basically all in at this point on Hilly. And what's really funny is in that interview, you can tell they never state it explicitly for obvious reasons, but you can tell that they did not expect to be out like at, at this week. They thought that they would get through this week and be in playoffs because the inference afterwards was like, Pad put out something like, oh shit, our season's over and we're not even going to play until January. And he was saying in the interview, like, we're a team who we're not doing well now, but we're ramping up. And if you give us a bit more time, we're going to be really scary. It's like, bitch, you don't get to play League of Legends for six more months. So this whole That's thing insane, came crashing down. I, I, I will mean, say, yeah, one, 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 of my, one of my big takeaways about this format, um, it will, yeah, get back to the specifics of it after, is that six months off for any team, any player, like... 
I, don't get me wrong, I think there should be, like, early exits from, from regular season, blah, 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 but six months off? That's absolutely absurd, thinking yeah. about it. Like, I know they need to leave a weird big window for, for Worlds and for, for for whatever in the off season, but, like, I, I think that, yeah, absolutely, the worst team should be punished by playing less top-tier League of Legends to a certain extent, but this feels like it's gone really overboard in some degrees like um because you, you're then got you've got people who are contracted for, for if you think about it from a team perspective you have people I, I don't even know if contracts would have to change after a certain point to say if we are eliminated at the earliest possible opportunity your contract length is lower or blah 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 you're not paid for this amount because imagine you're now sat as someone on the orgs of rogue um or vitality or whatever team that's eliminated like they have to play uh, pay players for like months where they are doing nothing. And particularly because they have gone out at the earliest possible opportunity. They're unlikely to be on your org next year as well, in, in a lot of cases, or at least all um, it, um, expecting some changes to come through. So you're just paying people to sit around with no future with your organization, which By I think way, is just... You know what's really, really funny? Yeah. Is that, so yeah. when, uh, so I sold, um, or a chunk of H2K was sold in 2016 to a, a American investment group, which is basically run by a bunch, basically by a law firm and a very, big hedge fund and anyway mm. the uh the most of the people involved in this and they were very involved on the day-to-day -day and stuff like that but they were not endemic to the scene one of the guys uh an awesome guy called richard lippy he was like 80 years old like he had no concept of league of legends really beyond what you know i explained to him and when this was going to like when they were putting out what the schedule was going to be like post franchising he was like looking at the data and the schedule and be like oh but this can't be right like because if you you know finish in this position you just do not play or do anything uh so like we're gonna have to look for third party tournaments and i was like oh no no no! riot don't allow third party tournaments like, no, no no i mean they can't do like yeah. what and then he was like then he goes by the way surely we could just get can we just get these guys to play dota in the off season and i was like well what else are they I, gonna do yeah i was like i can see why like from a, someone who's like from a layman's perspective who's not you know I can see exactly why he thought that. Like, it's a similar style of game and they've not going to got anything to do for six months. So that makes sense in his head. It was just really funny. I was like, no, they can't play Dota. <laughs> and he was just like mind blown yeah. by this. And the, this, thing, uh, the thing is with like traditional sports, you have players playing for a national team and then a regional team at some points. So you have stuff in rugby, you have like the Autumn Internationals and the Summer Series as well. Like, League, it's just like, what do these players do for half the year? Anyway, <sighs> we'll get specifically back to Vitality now. I just thought it was just like, bloody hell. I don't think they're a good team, don't get me wrong. But six months, that's bloody harsh. And we knew it was coming, but also like, Jesus. Yeah. Um, in terms of what specifically went wrong with this team, well, where do you even bloody start? Um, I think VTO's laning was shockingly awful. Um, I think that the tiebreaker they played against... Mad. I watched um, most of the Vitality games. I, I watched their last two, like, just a couple of hours before coming back on stream because I was like, okay, right, let's really autopsy this. Um, if you go back and watch the early lane of Fresky versus VTO, which is the Talia into Corky, it's worth mentioning Corky is pretty good in that matchup. In the very early levels, you expect Corky to do quite well there because Gatling Gun, um, Foss Bomb, and Valkyrie at first level are just really good until he needs a couple of levels into a queue. So you're really expecting Talia to get more stable at level 4 or 5 and you get multiple points in your queue. Um, but the early couple of levels, you're expecting um, the Corky to do fine in the matchup. The first clear is like Elure running from bot, bot quadrant up to top quadrant to steal red buff. And the reason why VTO can't um, interfere in mid lane is because you can. it doesn't show it on... The, I think the spectators really missed an important part of this game. Frescovy hits two unassisted shoves on VTO in early lane at like level 3. Like, and Vito has 200 HP to fight with once the invade is happening, and he can't do shit. And then after that, another unassisted shove hits, and he dies in uh, mid lane for first blood. Um, and then, like, a whole bunch of other stuff happens in that lane. I don't know what the hell Vito was doing on an individual level, but he was super disrespectful with his Valkyries, super disrespectful with his flashes. And his early laning phase set up a hugely game-winning state already for the side of, of, um, of Mad. Also worth noting, I find it really funny how Mad have only won games with Talia this split. That that all of their wins are, are Talia games, regardless of which role it is. But I think particularly Vito and early lane against that just completely threw Linsus under the bus because like, what is he gonna do with a Viego in his lane when you've got a pushing top and a pushing mid coming into you? So that was that was already bad enough. So I think that their early games and their laning is really pretty suspect. And as soon as it gets through into team fights, like this team just doesn't know how to position its carries and play around them. I, I, I have had a lot of um, 
I've had a lot of good good uh, good things to say about Kazi. This weekend, Kazi's team fight positioning was ass. Yeah. It almost game losing at points. There's one particular team. There's the, against the in the um in the Aurelian Soul game. That was that was the second game of the weekend, not the tiebreaker. I think it was right. Um, there was a couple of times where there was that one fight around the Baron pit where like someone hops over the wall. I think it was irrelevant hops over the wall, but then Kazi stays in the pit, tries to alter them down, and then just kind of gets caught there. Like there's just a huge disconnect in that moment in in that one game where like Vito and um, and Linz is like over the top of the pit trying to look for a pick, and I think it was I, I can't remember who was caught out. It was probably uh, yeah, I, I think it was the enemy jungle that was caught out on the other side. Um, but then, like, because Kazi's pushing up really aggressively and the other two are above the pit, there's no one to be standing in front of him. And then, like, Irrelevant ults him in a Camille ult, too, and then he's already stepped too far forwards. The rest of the team wasn't there to protect him going forwards. Um, and even though Kazi had, like, five kills at that point and been doing really good to get himself gold, he just can't team fight. Similarly, in the game, in the tiebreaker versus Mad, there's a point, really important fight, um, fight late game where... God, whereabouts was it? It was, um, a little further on where, like... Um, he stood really conservative back just in that route between mid lane tower and the blue buff area, and the rest of the team was walking through the river into in, um, from mid lane into the into the bot side. Um, and basically, a Talia wall comes off, and Kazi gets an ult off to get a first reset. And during his reset, get excited on Jinx, he gets zero auto attacks because he is walled off and he doesn't know he can't position into anything. He could have maybe gone to go help out um, one other side of the fight instead of waiting around the back of the wall. But I, I even think Kazi, who I think has been a really bright spark and the best player for his team had awful team fights this weekend yeah. too so early game's not looking great because of laning phase um i think particularly just their team fighting we called out their team fighting as being pretty crap it, it was disgraceful this weekend yeah what do you think kira what uh what is most to blame for the vitality collapse uh, <clears throat> i think it was a dev a dev de evolution from from spring mainly See, the, the upswing, if you go back in the show, we've talked about, you know, we've seen the aspects of, like, Vito beginning to aggressively and quite tactically be able to play out lanes. And then there was a point when they went towards playoffs, he actually just got worse and worse and worse. And then this meta, uh, well, that this the the picks are in right now, his laning on it has been absolutely woeful. I think the team really, really struggled to, like, enable the, like, their two best carry threats that are, cons like, consistent enough to, like, win the game in Photo on, on Karzi. Playing bot to top split carries is the hardest style to play in League of Legends, historically, ever. Even, Especially like, the with a mid lane that doesn't move. <laughs> yep. Even, so, uh, historically, it's the, like, think of the great, like, Korean team, Samsung Galaxy at Season 7 Worlds with QV and Ruler, when, and, you know, with the KT team, Smeb and Death. It took them years to make the style work. Um, and that was with some of the best players of all time and one of the best enabling bot lanes. And Karzai and Heli aren't that. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very, very hard thing to do when you try and move your resources around through a, a lane in the middle of the, the, the map that's also like immobile. And also, he's playing quite an immobile, like in a more immobile meta. It, it, it's just very, very hard to do. Uh, the, in the sense it could have been better given a more isolated nature but I don't think Photon was probably like playing either on, on the correct picks enough games where like being in the isolated matchups mattered enough like I don't, how many games of Camille did Photon actually play or like let's look and let me go check apologies guys let me just to give an idea right like, I usually have this off the top of my head he played four games of Renekton where it doesn't really matter unless you're getting insane lane domination one game of Camille, Camille one game of Ken and Twisted Fate, Aatrox, Cassante. So only one of them is really like devastating and isolated matchup. And so they didn't actually really try and enable that style for like Photon, which was one of the things like Rich, I know you were like quite big on, like given enough time and over a longer period. And you, you see that even BB had like big Camille games. So Vitality couldn't even get that. They, they, they really did have like an identity I, crisis. I will say them. the Cassante game versus SK was really clutch. He almost won them that game yeah, by he... himself. So like, it's, it, it, like it, it, and this is the no, kind of thing. Like, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, which it's is which is why like even yeah. this weekend you can see Photon doing God's work on some of these picks. Go, go back and watch some of those team fights where like his Cassante is the only thing which is like keeping them alive in some of those team fights, man. Which is I do yeah, think it, it, that the, it really is sad. I do think that Renekton was kind of a bit of a bait pick this uh, split because even though obviously it's strong in quite a lot of matchups in this meta. 
I didn't see many Renekton leads being converted into much. It was like... Oh, yeah. I, I, I only think, like, the top three or four Renekton players in the world should be playing it right now. Yeah. I think if you are, like, top LCK, if you're, like, Keen or whatever, um, I think if you're 369 or Bin or Breathe, actually, as well, he's really fucking good at Breathe's the, uh, really Renekton. good at it. Like, you have a couple of people who... The, the, the benchmark for Renekton is I dominate lane this hard that I my lead extends into the mid-game yeah. far enough to make this a useful pick. Basically, after 20... Well, 20 minutes, realistically. 25, if, you, if you're really good. You just prefer to be Cassante, Skana, yeah. or anything else, basically. And you find it really hard to get onto the carries. You don't have enough damage to one-shot people like you did with, like, the Mythic item, Eclipse meta, and shit like that. It's really hard to play this pick into mid-game. And I don't think, as we've seen before, there are many top laners which run away with an advantage enough to be game-winning in top side. Exactly. <laughs> if they, there's so many Renektons leaving lane with, like, let's call it a B-plus advantage, mm -hmm. and then you're not realistically going to win an important objective fight but pre-25 minutes, let's say, off the back of that B plus advantage. Um, and to me, that is in essence like when you have someone like Photon, and I think Kira said he played it four times. Uh, maybe it'd be extreme to say it's four wasted opportunities to put him on something, but it probably is. Like at least a couple of those probably should have been. By the way, the only wins were on Renekton. Everything else we lost on, it's four games, two wins. That's the only champion they like won with. Everything else was losses. And I know that doesn't mean this is not a point of criticism of Photon, by the way. I think Photon played generally like, pretty to very well. Um, obviously, just because the amount of games you play, there's going to be mistakes throughout. Um, but, you know what I mean? If you are trying to get, like, uh, wins or you're in, like, dire, like, straights, you often t can often turn to the extremes um, to, like, try and fix, like, problems. And I didn't even really see that from Vitality. Um, you know, you wanted to say what continuation, Rich? Like, how it was just did continue to get, like, worse and worse and worse. Um... I, I, like mm. it's in, it's insane. It's it's actually yeah. the point we're at. Or we're, the point we're at of like Helly's performance is it's crazy. And again, so, as I reference on Twitter, you know, may, I I don't take anything people say uh, in the you know when put on the spot as read as it were. But um, if you believe what they said in the interview they are committed to moving forward with hilly next year so we'll see like to me that is I impossible you cannot okay. i think it's well, grossly unfair on the other players on well, the team bare minimum then i think vto is gone and i think that vto is not going to get back to an lec team oh yeah um, not with the way that he's playing i think vto has probably had his time in the sun now which is such a shame because i think vto might end up being one of the well maybe it's not a what if but it feels like it's one of those situations oh, a massive where you... what if it's, I, I, yeah, in that case, yeah, yeah I think I think Vito is one of the huge what ifs of European history because it felt like he was the new age of super mid and he never got to develop. I well, do. He never developed. He, he, he never developed. Really yeah. Was, was I, the point as? I don't want to get like too too into this side of things, but I do think like his reputation, for example, like in solo queue, is atrocious. He's also a difficult player to work with on teams, and I think this undoubtedly would have. Oh, did you see their... after Mad locked them? Um, Nat, Mad knocked them out. Super said, "Enjoy your mo enjoy your vocation." As he hand shook him, because Vito was playing support for Super when he was playing Ezreal. Vito ran it down a couple of times, so Super tilted and died once, and then Vito just like hard ran it and started flaming him. And then I think it was Niski was on stream. No, it wasn't. Uh, I I can't remember who was on stream, but like Vito messaged them on stream. Might have been Kazi or something. In like DM, like it was all like um in like the league client, yeah. and it showed up on their streams like, oh my god, I just played with Super Azrael, Lord have mercy, effectively. So Super's like, I felt bad initially saying it to him. Then I remember what he said to me in solo queue, and I no longer felt bad. I'm <laughs> like, all right, I mean, I'd like to see that. But I'd like to see that carry on in terms of like engaging drama, but yeah. <laughs> but put this in the context. Go back to Methfit's video, and go get go grab Knock, and he was he in Shalke at the time, right? Yep. And I'm, to, I'm, you're gonna play, I'm gonna show you both mid laners. I'm gonna tell you, Nuck is going to end up being a better player than Vito. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. a yeah, damn. By the way, and I, I was such, literally saying every split, every year, right, that Nuck shouldn't be in the LEC, that he does not justify his split, but he actually made tangible improvements to his gameplay. Like this year, like last, that's why I had BDS so low at the start of this year. If you go look at my rankings, because yeah. I, I didn't believe in Shiu and Nuck, and in a big way, the, the, the leaps and bounds they made in terms of improvement was like insane. And Vithio sat static, he was on, he was just, he never changed. Meanwhile, mm. nu Nuclear Hint made tangible cha gameplay oh, uh, that changes by the, to by the way, gameplay, like... and now, like, I can't, I can now no longer sit here and say 
Well, because you know what I mean? Like, Winter Rich, I was sitting saying, Nuclear Rent was the best performing mid in the regular season yeah, portion. He, he played better than Caps in the individual games. Because, like, even though I have no preference to his gameplay, that is the results of it. And now we're at the point where I'm like, Vithio can't continue in the LEC, or he has to be on, like, a 10th place team. And Nuclear Rent's one of the best, like, better yeah. mids. You know and and I mean? also, I think I think we've also seen that I don't think it's actually worth building a team to play VTO's style if he's playing like this either. Yeah. Um, so I, think in, I, think, I think if you if you taken him from bits of last year or of of course like his misfits like MVP split in twenty twenty two, you're like okay, yeah, you can understand building a team around this. That that should be a mid to upper table team if it goes really well actually. Um, but yeah, I think we've seen now in back to back rosters because I think this was incredibly evident at Heretics too because this was like the Ancos, the Ancos Ebby, um, um, and then obviously Ruby was replaced by um, Ruby, my by, man. by by Vito. There were basically like because Vito couldn't lose from lanes, teams genuinely found game winning angles because Vito never left mid lane. You can go and attack a side lane early and just hyper gank top or bot lane. You know that Vito is never going to be there. And we even saw that again this weekend where SK got um, Niski got himself that early shuffle in bot side, which ended up accelerating that bot side when they had the Callista Renata. So that is a kill lane bot lane that needs to be ahead. Vito doesn't get move. I mean, he was playing the early install. It's hard to move. But the fact that he doesn't even drop a wave to try and cover bot um, at that point at level six, where you can still impact the game as an Soul, even if you're not strong at that point like to me I, I i don't know i think i think he's just never learned the appropriate times to drop waves um yeah. and oh. and i don't think I've, we've seen this for two years now and i on multiple different rosters which have obviously tried evidently tried hard if you listen to listen to the coaches anyway to try and change that style to a degree i just don't think it's happened so what do you do now with this player i, I think at this point you might have just run his course you know what and let's actually be truthful here because i'm not just trying to like pinpoint they are extreme halisang extremely terrible Vithio, pretty terrible. Karze had a downwards. Yeah. Overall yeah the, the team fight I was referencing, by the way, was 24 minutes against Mad Koi, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. um fo Photon, you know, uh, man of, uh, like, uh, uh, thing of the times. You victim of the times. There you go, right? Linsas. Right, okay. Here's the interesting one. I heard many things about Linsas. I've seen many things about Linsas. I think Linsas is a very, very good and capable player. What I do not think he is good at, though, in general, from watching the games that actually happened, he might be good at this, but watching the games that actually happened, lane coverage. Like, the thing, the skill set that, like, Yankos is, like, good at, and, um, what's it called? Uh, Razork's really, really good at. I don't think Linsas is, like, well, from what I've watched, I understand his, like, lanes weren't always going, like, perfectly, but, like, the timings that he would, like, be there for, and, like, how he was, like, approaching them, you can see this re uh, really well in, like, the Sejuani one, uh, where he like covers like Photon's wave crash, Photon gets gone on, and then Linsas tries to cover the exit, and he obviously just like dives and accelerates, the, like causes the acceleration there. But if you, you look at the entire way it's like pulled, it's played off. Um, he's like late to that. Like anyway, like he's off by not a lot, but it's enough for it, an acceleration like yeah, to happen. I and think. Then, yeah. No. 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 I mean, I I don't think you're wrong when it comes to the this split at all. I think I think he is capable of being a decent lane coverer. I mean, his primary skill set. I've always said this is he is he plays his biggest skill is inspired's biggest skill. He is an excellent uh power farming jungler who play who can hyperscale on carries while not um not putting his team at deficits by doing so, yeah. which is a very difficult thing to do. He I did do... try and cover his bot lane in that one game, but at the end the big play when Niski makes the sweep, it's just 3v4. Yeah, so he does. Yeah, he has yeah, one yeah. play in this week, so it's not completely crap, but, but yeah, I just I, wanted to I, highlight it. I think when it comes to covering lanes, I think for, um, and I don't want to play like the rookie excuse card, because um, I'm going to mention something about that as well in a second, but I think that when the lane that is suffering the most from a pure laning perspective is mid, it is oh, very fucked. difficult for him to show his ability to be right. I mean, I'll right be time. the first person to extend that like open palm of like you. It is impossible, yeah. um, for you to like be doing it. It's why like at times like Yankos's job looked impossible when he had Vito and Ruby yeah. as his like mid laner, and he was still doing some like I still doing a very good job. Uh, well, the game states he was like handed. It's just I'm just talking about that as like the package. I think it's worth. Um, yeah, 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 mentioning yeah, sure. uh, and could you... I think Linsus would level up SK. I think he'd be yes. better on SK. He'd be, right? be so amazing. Magic. It'd be so and SK yeah. already SK. look really good. So yeah, yeah, I think yeah. I think that'd be a good spot for him. So I I want to see what happens in the off season with this team because like 
I, I looked through this whole weekend. Sadly, the game against G2... Oh, by, by the way, this is another thing, too. Um, it was the last pick Alistair against G2, right? Where, effectively, um, G2 locked in Ash Braum, and I think it was the last pick Alistair for Hillisang. I'm just going to say this straight out. That is draft suicide. You never play Alistair into an Ash Braum. You cannot win that lane. The fact that picks like that could get through as well, when you know that Hillisang is a player that... He, he anti-snowballs incredibly hard. Like, he falls behind the game and he doesn't stop. That's the worst thing about him Him in the in this split has been that when he falls behind, he makes the same play. It's, it's, it's the worst kind of element, ML, the worst of MLXG, right? Where, like, when you're behind, it doesn't stop him from doing what he's doing. And yet he's trying to, like... He makes the play to get you ahead. And when he's ahead, he keeps on like, <laughs> he makes more yeah. plays. <laughs> when he's behind, he makes the play to make you even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stuff like that. So, yeah. so, like, I don't know. I mean, it's it's there is no singular issue with Vitality. Their, their laning has been suspect. I think their drafts have varied. I think that one against G2 with the Alistair, of course, that is, that's game losing. Genuinely, that last pick. That is game losing. You cannot... I think just pick the Nautilus, level up W, level 1, and just survive lane. Don't play Alistair and be a, you know, just a sack of meat for the entirety of laning phase. Um, I think the team fighting has been really, really suspect um, on multiple levels. There have been some points where, you know, the SK game was very close at points because they managed to get some really good layered ultimates, but then the team fight which lost them the game was them just throwing their ultimates to the winds and having, like, three shit ultimates. And then, like, they lose around the barrel and they just completely lose the game. So, I, I don't know. There's there's not... There, it's really hard because you can't even pinpoint individual issues. It really does feel like you just put your finger on one league and, like, a million others are sprouted out to you. So, yeah, I'm really sad to see this team completely fall apart. I had a much higher... Obviously, much higher expectations of this, but... Yeah, I, it wouldn't surprise me to see... Well, Photon said... Even Photon said, I don't know what next year holds for me. I want to see Photon... Actually, that's the point. Which players would you like to see, and where would you like to see them back from this roster? Because I don't think I would put Vitor anywhere. I think Hillisang... I mean, he's obviously still there, I guess. So he's... We have to keep him, but... I don't know. A lot of these players, I feel like it's just like a I mean, poison it's, chalice it's, right now. Obviously, you know? it's a... It's a... Two different questions. Like, if your vitality, what you should want to see is bringing Photon back, keeping Linsus, and obviously trying to keep hold of Kakazi. That you know, those would be the three. Where, and people would say, oh, but they were so bad. You got to change more than that. You don't have to change more than that. Hillisang and Vito were so bad that you don't have to change more than that. A change, a, a change in your mid lane, and uh, and how much of a symbiotic position support is in terms of how jungle works and so on. Like two changes can definitely turn them into a top top whatever team so yeah those would be the changes i'd make me being selfish i would like to see kazi go to fanatic personally because i think that makes that team good change, uh, yeah. a good team a better team which is better than a bad team to an okay team so you know but i'm just selfish so it's what it is <laughs> anyway let's move on to uh another team who you know i don't think we had as many expectations for but they're still just a pretty, pretty sad state of affairs, which is, of course, our friends at Rogue. Um, yeah, again, like, where do you start with this team? We had propped up Finn at one point in time as being, you know, well, at least he's playing decently solid. He fell off a fucking cliff. He was horrendous again this week. Um, Larson, as I think Larson, you know, was ramping up from like a sort of, again, keeping the context of Larson, not in mid lanes in general. He's ramping up from like a 2 out of 10 Larson to like a 6 out of 10 Larson, maybe, but then kind of just stayed there, static. And by the way, I'm just going to, I've said this before, actually, but when I first said it, it was more tongue of cheek, n tongue and cheek. I now do kind of actually believe it to a certain extent. Larson is someone, in my opinion, that when things aren't going well, he is a KDA player. This guy refuses to try and make proactive plays when he doesn't believe his team can win. He actually just refuses to. There are so many windows, especially in this past week as well, where he could have gone in, he could have tried to do something, but he was scared or scared's probably not in the right word. Just cared too much about his own stats. It was ridiculous. I'm like, fair enough. Yeah, you probably aren't going to win. But bro, no one who matters is looking at your games and gives a fuck about your KDA. No this one this cares. even reminds me like, of like mm -hmm. one of one of his worst builds ever, and don't trust me, there are a couple because a lot of them are on Ari, and I remember this as a personal attack. He had a Shiv Lichbane Everfrost game where it's like, okay, none of these most there are there are two different problems here. Where the only target he attacked in late game was not Annie, but Tibbers. So he didn't even use any of his auto attacking items at that point because he's like, I don't want to play close, I'm standing over here. Okay. This is the problem. You're never put you need to put yourself in harm's way to do something to impact this game, and you're not. So we've seen this 
beyond even just this split as well. So, and yeah. what, 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 does he, the, oh, what does he think the win con of this team is? Like Zoli's landing hooks? Like fucking hell, dude! Like spoiler alert: Markoon is having a horror split. It's not going to come from your advantages. Aren't going to come from jungle. Finn, even when he's playing fine, is not going to be the win con for this team. Comp is laning with Zoli's, and Comp hasn't looked like a top eighty carry in a while anyway. Bro, you are the win con. You need to be the guy who makes the play, the game winning plays, and you're not even trying. Like that's the thing that's most annoying to me. Like he's not even trying. Do I want to see Rogan playoffs because Larson makes some big plays and sneaks them in? No, I don't. Do I think it'd be really cool for his career to show like, hey, look, a, a really good player can still stand out on a bad team? Yeah, I would have liked to have seen that from being a fan of Larson for how many fucking years. Like, yeah, I'd have liked to have seen that, but he didn't even try. And this remark, and people will hate this as well. Um, although most of the people that watch TSM probably don't even watch League anymore. But Bjergsen used to do this a little bit as well in, in TSM. Uh, uh, in like kind of. He had periods of doing that. Oh, uh, well, yeah. It, not like all for his career, but he there were series where he phoned it in to try and keep the 0, zero, zero scoreline when games weren't going well. Um, but whatever. Anyway, I, I I really don't like that. But yeah, Kira, what do, what do you make of our boys, well, Rogue? Shout out to Nymera, because I had them sixth, and I think you as well did, you as well, Rich, for the end of the year rankings that we did at the very, very start. Oh, maybe. Um, and, and they're tenth. And, I, and I'll, I'll go out and I'll say, because let's go through it. Okay, so I thought they would be like sixth based off of like, you know, the core, having played before. By the way, dude, I really nearly, like, to begin with, I really nearly put them super high. And then I remember a couple of things happened which were really off-putting. And I ended up changing them and moving them down. I nearly had them, like, second or third, dude. Like, holy so, shit. Well, like I thought, yeah. like, Comp and Larson is your, like, back line. I was like, I said the famous line. That can only be so bad. Um, and they're real floor-raising players because they're really stable. And they're actually qu they're quite proficient laners, you know? Well, I got I got taught a couple of lessons. This is you know I don't, I don't watch enough European like solo queue you know to keep, keep tabs on everyone's like skill set. So I do remember watching in houses and Comp was the worst. I said it at the very very start yeah. of the year. Comp was the worst person I'd ever seen um in in houses in like a long long time. He was atrocious. What went wrong with this team? They actually here's an interesting thing. They had the uh, old fanatic problem that uh where they, when they were going into playoffs all those years ago, they're actually good at nothing. Um, and they got better at almost nothing. I know Nymera, for talking points sake, you were talking about them making like uh, timing plays and like timing attacks that were like a little bit like a coordinated, but like were they actually good if they like... Got yeah, they were proactive, but it wasn't good proactive. And what's worse, doing nothing or doing something badly? And, and you see some of the glimmers of like Larson playing Azir and sometimes Huey and Corky where he's like proficient on these like scaling packs. But across the board, this team was... So very, very black. And then, like, you'd have Markun just randomly being good in week three of every single, like, splat of, like, winter and, like, spring. And he would just, like, pop off for, like, a couple of games just before, like, they get, like, shipped off to, like, nowhere. This team was just unendingly, like, frustrating. And here's the funny thing. Not me. Other people used to big up the this coaching staff. You know what I mean? They would say that this coaching staff had to be do good because, um... Like, because of the results. And again, this is the danger for me because now they're 10th. And so, like, the coach is this coaching staff to, like, blame here? Because of, you know what I mean? Because you're now... Because the same people plus N raid. Uh, Seal isn't there anymore. And so... Yeah, I, he's I, I, yeah. yeah, so I, 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 don't, I don't know. Because this, like... To me, this team, like, lost, like, a lot of its, like, identity, like, over time. Uh, they, like, they really didn't look to be, like, improving in, like, anything. Um, and the minuscule amounts of props that you could give, it's like, it was like individual players creating like small incremental advantages. But the way they would lose games were like so catastrophic. They were just like the most awful like teamwork team. It's like um, Dom like quoted and said that. It. It's like when you're watching teams like Rogue, right? And you try to start trying to analyze map states and game states, it's pointless. There's no point. Because the, the series of events that are going to like happen from when you talk, about like the freeze frame are just incoherent fucking craziness. Like Zolas is just going to like engage onto someone with no information behind them. He dies, Lars is behind him, he dies, they die, it turns into a baron. And any normal team, that would never happen. Like that that game still never happen, but with Rogue it can happen. By the way. Like that's uh, just a regular occurrence. So yeah. when you go to No, I was gonna say, um 
also like I hated the whole like when Rogue finally won the the it was like oh see the coaching staff's really good because they always do really well in regular season and maybe they had some choking issues but now they finally got over the line like I saw it in such the opposite way it's unreal again we're never gonna have like a true insight into exactly how the coaching works yeah, exactly. we don't see the screen. but let's look at it this way Rogue with the exact same team they won the title with apart from inspired instead of Malrang got reverse swept in two finals or no they they did straight they got 3 0 in one of the finals and then they got reverse swept in the other final yep. and were reverse swept in the previous um season when they reached the final to go low bracket or whatever to me that showed bad coaching because for anyone who actually watched those finals and saw how those games went there was zero attempt at adaptation throughout those games it was ridiculous like it was actually ridiculous and even though people were like ah they were the underdogs blah, blah, blah. dude the championship winning rogue team but you have inspired instead of malrang is an unbelievably good team historically for europe like Oddo and Larson at the time were like the best two, let's call them control laners, like solo laners in the league. Like they weren't necessarily the most oppressive in terms of how they play. Like Larson's not perpetually shoving people under tower. Oddo typically is. They outvalued either, everyone but... else in team fights. Yeah. That game. And they, they were incredibly proficient in lane. They were incredibly proficient and efficient in um, team fights. And then you had Trimby as well, who was obviously um, the only good, really good enchanter player who could also play some engage. Comp was just a solid AD carry. And you had Inspired, who was a fucking monster. Dude, that team should have won titles and they should never have got reverse swept in that final. Yeah, no, then, it was Hans Sammer. Yes, it, it, so... it was Hans Sammer in the, in the reverse. Oh, yeah, sorry. Hans, yeah, Hans, 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 Hans yeah. Sammer, yeah. Sorry, yeah, it's even more uh, appara Apparently, Inspired and the rest of the team did not get on. Yeah, so, no, they didn't. Yeah. But <laughs> I, don't, I don't care. Because again, it's like, it neither did the team that went to Malmo, but they just had True. like this mindset of like, oh, it's one fucking weekend, let's just put all the shit to the side and like see what happens kind of thing. And that team won with a worse AD carry and a significantly worse jungler, and they 3 0 G2. Like, yep. dude, that inspired lineup, dude, I'm just gonna go for They're it. The again biggest for Odd like... Wamne, inspired, Larson, Han Sammer. Trimby, that team was fucking insane. Like player for player, that's like a top five EU team ever, like for sure. So this idea of like, oh, the rogue staff are geniuses because they were the other. Like, please, you go back and actually watch how those ser those uh, seasons went. Like well, that team should have won three titles. I think mate. I I wonder particularly for rogue whether um because I think this applies to the players, but I also think this might apply to the coaching staff as well. Rogue never transferred into the early skirmish meta well, because there was a point but after 2022, it became what, much... Well, it became... It became it, it, after, after 2022, after 2022, it was, um, the, the game got much more about early aggressive jungles um, and like early aggressive lanes and playing kill lanes rather than outvaluing from those lanes and going into team fights later after you've chilled for the early game. Because what Rogue used to do was like, all their lanes would lock their opponents in lane, Malrang would do whatever the fuck he wanted, and the lanes would chill until they needed to get towards a two item team fight. That was the way that they played, and it wasn't always the most interesting way to play, but in terms of like watching it as a viewer entertainment standpoint, but it was very effective for that group of players. I think as soon as they had to play towards, you know, being proactive in the early, well, being more proactive in the early game um, than you had to beforehand, but obviously in the case of Rogue, Malrang was his own proactivity for better and for worse, but like, yeah, I think that they really, really struggled to deal with that kind of change. In the same way that, you know, I think that a lot of teams struggle, particularly this is a thing which I keep bringing about the LPL, a lot of teams struggle to change from the double Herald meta to the Grubs meta, because two Heralds allowed you to take down mid, mid lane turret for free if you're good around playing around Heralds. And it's very easy to understand what you could do with that. And a lot of teams have really struggled to change from that afterwards. So yeah, I, I wonder whether true. there's... I wonder whether there's like been some of these systematic changes which have just never I wonder if this is kind of like a backlog of the big systems being changed which haven't been adapted to on a player and a coach standpoint. Maybe right, should we um, just so that, not to like fuck the system. Are we going to talk about mad lines uh, later on like uh, I don't know themselves or no, making not. our robot. Right, okay, can I just say mad lines by the way there is a potential, right? The mad lines could we could be talking about them if El Yoya did not have like an mega like individual like weak, okay? They could be here right now. They could have lost to Rogue. They could have lost to Vitality as well within their fucking remit, right? But El Yoyo had like a massive individual like two game series. He was in the last week. El Yoyo was very, 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 very good um individually, and like basically the player that he needed to be like all the time 
like if he wants to play an individual kind of style of jungler, he was for those specific games. However, I would still be shitting my pants if I was um, Mad Lions because again Vitality and against Rogue, who we, like we are considering are absolutely woeful, may I add, okay? It was like you were playing off against them and they weren't even like dominant wins and the games were like they are, they teams are so terrible individually, right? And the strength of Mad Lions is supposed to be coherent teamwork and that all these guys want to play together and Mad Lions were equally, but only like, in terms of execution were they better, but they were equally as awful. So they have got so much work to be putting in because if you actually watch these like games, they are horrendous. So in regards to that whole coherent teamwork thing, so um, my talking point for BDS up until this split was that they don't know how to play side lanes they use De um, adam's champion pool to mask the fact that they can't play side lanes so they play such obnoxious champions in 1v2s and 1v3s that they never need to know how to play side lanes adam's got that sorted i think mad had one of the worst side laning performances i have seen in eu this split on their first game of this weekend versus um oh merwin BDF. i was insane merwin was one of the worst people i've yeah, ever seen and, and, and last weekend, as well on the corky i he he made genuinely game losing plays as well in side lanes. It was and, and the problem was they got shown up by a team that now knows how to play side lanes, um, and and they obviously didn't. And what you can see after that is them drafting multiple globals everywhere all the time to mat to, to fix that kind of problem. And credit to them, when we look at teams like Vitality and Rogue, which of course this whole kind of thing is in in kind of like the perspective of. Um, I think that they have had similar issues and they've never been able to find that band-aid in the ways that BDS did with Adam's champion pool. Or in this case, you know, if you look at the game which they played against um, Rogue the first time, they had, what, Twisted Fates, um, Talia mid lane, and then Kaisa. They had triple globals to pull on them at all times. In fact, what that I'm trying to remember if that one was versus... No, that was a Vitality one. Um, but they still had um, stuff like Talia, Kaisa uh, across multiple games. Every single one of Mad's wins this split have had a Talia in it. Like, whether it's jungle or whether it's mid lane. And I think that um, that has really helped this team just paper over the cracks of, no, we don't really know how to play around quick rotations and um, side lanes and stuff like that. I think they are better than the other bottom teams when it comes to grouped up fights. But I think particularly the globals um, made things much, much more um, powerful for them. And I think particularly um, they use those, the, the, the team fight walls to really punish bad team fighting shapes from Rogue and from Vitality as well. I already talked about Kazi in that one 24 minute fight, gets one auto attack off in the entire fight, doesn't get any out autos off during his passive of the get jinxed, um, get excited on jinx. Um, so like when you compare what Mad managed to do when they were on one freaking win and they managed to turn things around into a tiebreaker scenario just by saying, well, this is how we pay, pay, paper over the cracks and four something out of this how the hell can other teams not do that um and like at least find something to paper over the cracks like if there is a problem like oh we don't know how to engage well or whatever another thing which we saw a lot of teams do and i call this out for lpl at the start of the year and i think this is something which for some reason people let mad do as well um is stuff like viego reset comps you don't have to be good at team fighting if all you're aiming for is the first kill in a fight and we <laughs> saw that in the tiebreaker which was like what they had they had um yeah, Jinx execution Viega, they had the double reset. The ultimate, where it's like, execution it's like, comps are the ultimate and, level of and when you have players team. like Hillisang or, or Zoelius who are playing Nautilus by the way Nautilus in the current meta is not very tanky in the previous splits he has been um, in current and different patches, I think you'd much rather be playing stuff like Leona or Alistair, which can at least survive a little longer on the front line. In the game they played against Rogue, it did pretty much just come down to the fact that, um, well, multiple multiple fights this week this weekend was effectively just like, well, we didn't have to be good at team fighting. You missed a hook, or you've got yourself into a bad position. You've hooked the wrong target. You die and you reset. I think that might have done a decent job of like papering over the cracks to make sure that a lot of their flaws and coherency and in terms of map play was changed. Where the hell was this kind of stuff from from the other teams? How, how could we? How could they not like figure out these I mean, more easy to play con teams? Yeah, you know, this is why I'm glad that um, again, it's because whatever would have happened, I suppose I would have been glad that that had been the result, if that makes sense. Because I'm glad Mad did get it into playoffs because they actually tried to do something with like a relatively clear goal and like execute on it. And we do at least have some recent history to suggest they could maybe find an identity and play towards that which I don't think the other two teams are capable of at the moment. Oh, they deserve it. Uh, yeah, they deserve it 100%. They, yeah, they absolutely 100%. deserve it. 100%. Um, the sad thing, obviously, is that Mad could not have a worse matchup. And I include G2 in that because BDS are 
the LCK macro kings who will punish, who are also the kings of punishing mistakes. And the mad have a, literally a 0% chance to win this series, by the way. Clip it, whatever. They have a 0% chance to win this series. It is actually, unless multiple players break their hands, it is unwinnable. They are like the antithesis of those Mad Lions performances from the last couple of weeks, even the games that they won. Like, they are clean as fuck and they are better players. Like, Mad and Messi as fuck. And, yeah, have there's a skill diff. So, um, rough one for them, but, you know, double the limb, whatever. Uh, right, let's move on to two European teams who are uh, taking part in the tournament that shall not be named. Um, and we're going to, you know, look at these lineups. They're, I mean, it's just Clash of the Atlantic, really, isn't it? I don't know what this other tournament's going on, but this is just a, a throwback. Uh, let's start by talking about a rematch of uh, Team Liquid versus Fnatic, which we all know how that went last time around. Um, we don't have too much recent data on Liquid, as LCS has only just started. Uh, they're 3-0, for what it's worth. Um, I'm told by people who watch LCS that uh, APA and Yeon are actually off uh, fraud watch. They've passed all their fraud checks and actually apparently look really good. So I don't know if that's no, true. No, I, 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 as okay, someone well, who watches, no, no, no. Like, w one of them's off fraud watch. Like, what are we, are we talking about? Nah, anyway, I'll let you finish. Oh, anyway, oh, sorry. again, Kira, I don't watch, I, I do not watch LCS at all. So I'm just uh, throwing that out there as what I've been told. Maybe it was said with a lot of irony and that flew over my head. I don't know. But um, regardless, uh, I think people, because of the storylines, are excited to see this one. Um, I'm going to frame it like this again, because we want to sort of keep on the um, European uh, projecting into playoffs and then summer finals kind of angle. Nymera, what are you hoping to see from Fnatic uh, in this matchup, but also like specifically at the tournament that shall not be named to make you think that, you know, they could have a, a pretty good run at a G2 or a BDS should it come? Um, uh, Oscar Rinnan and Noah need to not get lost in the source. Basically, uh, like I, with this is the first time that Noah's going to be under pressure, like in terms of big event, different scenario for a while. It's the big thing to learn from that. I mean, yeah, basically just seeing if they can emotionally hold it together. That's that's the big learning. Very, point very, very, very quickly on that though, like when it comes to Noah, obviously this is something that's been discussed at length. Obviously, the, the, his own teammates have talked about it. He's talked about it. But is that actually like the problem with Noah or is the fundamental problem with Noah that Noah just isn't actually that great like I'm asking really has yours has this split changed your mind at all because most people say that Noah's had a pretty yeah. good split would you co-sign that it doesn't matter it's best of ones in Europe like it, it doesn't matter it's that's one of the big problems for me it's like so in the same way so I did a big power rank ranking on LPL recently where I went through all 17 teams and at the top I have top esports right now um yeah. And my my one negative caveat is, what the hell happens if Tien falls apart on, on like, the, the, the elimination games again, or in a finals or elimination game? Like, we just don't get to tell, because they've been playing in a group stage where they were the top-ranked team, and they get to chill through that. Fnatic, they've looked good as a team. Um, multiple players on decent form. Um, yeah, lo Ooh. lost, you know, yeah, I'm, well, okay, okay, whatever, sure. They look like a fine team. No, 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 what, I'm what, saying, the, it... I think there's a big highlight of someone who isn't in decent form right yeah, now. Well, I think, yeah. I, yes, exactly. I think that Humidoy getting solo killed randomly is like, what the hell is this guy doing? But hey, I mean, like, whatever. Like, there's not much for me to take away from, like, low pressure, best of ones, where Fnatic were obviously going to make it through into playoffs. Like, there was nothing really at stake for them there. Now, if they were best of threes and things got heated up and they had a best three versus G2 and it went to game three, maybe we get close enough to And even then, it's, there's no stakes to it. There's no stakes to it, really. Not for the teams which have kind of slid through easy kind of weeks. So... I, I've learned very little about Fnatic in regards to the things which I would like to pay attention to, and maybe this gives us that, but yeah. we'll see. Uh, have, you, have you watched any LCS at all, Nightmare? Have you seen Liquid play? Uh, yeah, I have. Not all of the games. I it, So the great thing about the time zone for me is that, because, you know, no other leagues happen at that point. It's just before I kind of, like, go to bed. So I often, watch, I often catch the first series before I go to sleep, because then it's, like, midnight-ish yeah. around here. And I think I did catch Liquid versus FlyQuest. And yeah, APA's been, APA's been pretty good. His majors have been pretty fine. Um, I don't think LCS has really caught up to the whole a AD mid AP jungle meta, but then again, very few teams have worldwide, and that's going to be a doozy when teams get to, get to figure that one out and they get, you know, um, really rammed with that one. But yeah, I think APA has been doing fine on a laning sense. I think Impact is still Impact. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can't remember all of my big takeaways, but yeah, I mean, they, they had a pretty fun series of over FlyQuest. I remember that being... Um, 
I mean, that's really also interesting about it. I mean, again, not that we place much stock in this tournament, but um, that's also, I guess, <laughs> like if you are an NA fan who gives a you know what about this tournament, then the fact that LCS has barely started it puts them at even more of a disadvantage, doesn't it? I mean, they've and got... they're traveling. They're traveling a huge time zone for it. Yeah, so. like, um, I mean, Top Good Esports, luck. for example, have played, I believe, 13 games because, what, they're 12 and 1 or whatever. BLG played a bit more because they lost, like, 15 games or something. The LCS team has played three. Like, seems a bit imbalanced. But when is it ever not imbalanced at international play for the West? Uh, yeah, Kira, what do, what do you make of this... Uh, this one what are you hoping to see from Fnatic? i would assume you know humanoid playing like a human would be a good start no, it's a reversal because like last time humanoid like played really well and then yeah. other people on the team like let him down Oscar drafting Roman, was yeah. atrocious you know like drafting was utterly atrocious the scouting report on tl by the players and coaching staff was terrible what do i want to see you know I, it's the same thing from Fnatic. you know I want bit more consistency, and I'll get a revolver out and put it to my head. I'd be better off asking for that for Christmas, like fucking blow my brains out because it looks like it's never going to get there. Um, you know, same thing as El Noah head not exploding under a bit of pressure. I think Oscarin over the average has actually like lived up to the idea that he is like getting better at like, um, yeah. you know, the laning and stuff. He isn't like just death pushing his lanes like all the time. Humanoid has been a Abysmal since they went six and zero, like utter, oh, like shambolically terrible. Um, part and parcel of him, like again, I wish I could grab these players by like their heads and like shake them. But you're trying to explain to them, a lot of them just probably just don't care. But his whole idea is like you, you play as you practice, and if you practice like a decade, you end up playing like a decade. The way you remove the inconsistency is by caring about your gameplay all the time. Like that. That's, You're such like, a wonderful Cho turn of phrase, Kira. <laughs> no, but it's true. Like Chovy didn't end up being Chovy by accident. Chovy's Chovy because, like, if you go look at how Chovy practices in solo queue, and you go look at Chovy from like 2019, he's literally had the same idea about how to play League of Legends, and this is the end manifestation. It is utter consistency, like a consistency of all uh, uh, the ability to command consistently, say, to an almost ridiculous degree, right? Faker's, Faker's the same for a huge portion of his career. Yeah, his ability to just command consistency at any, like, any given time for, like, series play is ridiculous. Um, and we just don't really have that in Europe, even, like, someone as good as, like, Caps. Uh, and I, I'm not as informed in like what's going on in like scrims and practice and stuff like that. But like humanoid is a ridiculous component of that. Um, they really do need to like overcome like TL here for them to even be taken remotely serious as like a team. The reason I kind of screwed my face up as like Appa in terms of the fraud watch is because like APA is like a good player and he was he could have he was always like but he's a good player in terms of like the remit in which his team gets him to do a job. Um, this is the same of like. Pole Belter when he played on the double lift teams of like Impact, Pole Belter was like a fine or a good enough player to win LCS with, right? But you would never at any point in time like describe him as like an elite level mid laner because the vast, all the different facets of the game to like be good at, they might be like A or like in some of Appa's case like S plus on specific champions, but there's other like detrimental, like at APA and sidelines takes like ridiculously like bad like value trades, gets them killed like isolated 1v1, like situations you should just not be, like, taking. And so, like, his threat assessment and, like, 1v1s inside is, like, extremely, extremely poor. Uh, but, like, you've got that into, like, consideration. But, you know, he's up against, like, a, a humanoid who can't seem to be able to get his, like, game together. So there's not a lot to say there. I think, obviously, you could have the same consideration. I think poor JJ's not just magically repaired his hands. I still think he's, like, pr like mechanically is still... Very, very, very poor, and it, it is on the cards for Jun and Noah to actually have a winning matchup into this bot lane specifically. But like, it's on the cards. I'm not saying Noah and Jun could do it. They could also lose it, by the way. Like yeah. they, they themselves are their own version of fuck up artists. This is the problem when you talk about Fnatic. You talk about all it's such uncertainties because of the fucking invariance of this team. They're very hard to like re uh, organize, but. If Fnatic like come out of like l like lanes like pretty even and stuff like that, I actually do think across the average, I trust like Razor's like acceleration plays, but like realize that this is a bit of a coin cost um matchup here where the, any different face of Fnatic could like show up and TL are a good enough team to catch like the throws. Uh, you know, they're a very, very consistent team. You know, Oscar's going to be up against Fnatic, uh, be up, up against Impact. He's going to get to run that back, you know. Um, Impact 
isn't some god top laner at laning. You know, you've got to see the Oscar that beats 369, not the Oscar that loses to, like, irrelevant and ridiculous ways every other week. So that's my takeaway. Them, like, just to, like, touch on it, them going any further in this tournament, that's it for me. They can beat this one team, and if they beat anyone over, anyone further than this, that team, it'll be a, a miracle. Angels coming down mm. from the heavens level, like, miracle, I will consider it. Uh, because... This team has no business. This, this, this team can't even muster itself to even practically challenge for Europe right now. They, they, they were better than G2 when they were 6-0 by like a considerable enough margin that they might have been able to front run it, and they didn't improve. They got actively worse week By to the week way, to week. let me ask you this, Kira, as I you know ask every week on our uh, LCK show when I ask you if uh, you still think Yike is better than Ona. Do you still think Fnatic would be favoured in a matchup against BDS? In Europe, like, but, like you're asking in terms of like, um, like I'm if, just, they if they were like playing a, each no. other tomorrow in a best of five, like, no, no, yes, no, no, because like you're, I'm analyzing <laughs> the games that have happened, but given like the course of like time moving forward, like Fnatic are more favorable to like hit like the higher peaks than BDS, Ooh, but, but BDS right that. now are very far ahead of them because they regress so much. I think this See, BDS, this BDS team is. Better than any now. version yeah. of Fnatic that has ever existed with those group of Fnatic players, by the way. And I'd say, really? by, I'd say by a distance. Like, fair enough. I think they're much better. Um, um, I think this BDS team is the best version of BDS as well. By the way, I don't think it's you know. Uh, but I think when BDS played Fnatic in the best of five, I think they were way better at League of Legends than Fnatic, and then completely bottled a two zero up five thousand gold lead or whatever it was. And I think this BDS is better than that BDS. And this Fnatic is the same Fnatic we've seen for however long. So, yeah, I don't really put much stock into that. Um, by the way, before we talk about G2, um, as you guys are both uh, LPL enjoyers, we're not going to talk about these matchups because if anyone wants to talk... First of all, I don't want to talk anymore about the Esports World Cup, really. And also um, because, you know, we've talked about Gen.G and T1 a lot on our other show, which you can go check out if you want our most recent thoughts on them. But as you two are both LPL uh, enjoyers and we don't have an LPL show, I wanted to get your thoughts on just sort of BLG and uh, TES as teams right now because they are yeah. the best two teams in uh, LPL. But for people who don't watch LPL, they might think, well, BLG is probably the best team and they're going to... Well, But actually, you know, we've talked about Jackie Love and Mako maybe being the best bot lane in the world. Are TES the best team in LPL at the moment, my merit? If you would like to have a really big rundown on this, I have a full... Here we go. Hour and a half rundown, tap power ranking on the entire LPL right now post groups. Um, and in that list, I put BLG as third. Ooh, so okay. BLG aren't even in my top two right now yeah, because I'm so freaking disappointed yeah. in them. Now, I think realistically, by the end of LPL playoffs, they, they'll definitely be contending, blah, blah, blah. But like, the, the, what they showed in groups was a disgrace for that team. Like, they were super disrespectful. Knight's on crap form. He can't play AD carry mids. Um... Bot lane are the deer which run into the pool when you leave them untended, so you need to play towards bot side, which really hampers like their, their diversity because they should be able to carry through all three lanes, but two of their lanes are not great. They're still top three because, that like, yeah, but they still have these huge upsides. But, um, yeah, BLG are weird. I, I know you asked in regards to, like, are oh, Jackie Love and Mako the best bot lane in the world right now, blah, blah, blah. Elk and On are really, really good if you play towards them. And we saw there was a great game. Game two of BLG versus LGD, their last series of groups. We saw Elk and On, like, get ganked at the level three dive of the Callista Renata. And that was one of the most dominant bot lane performances we've seen this entire year. Elk gets, like, a... They get, like, a 2v3 triple kill um, in topside um, a little later into the game. And he ends up running away with five kills. So they're really good, but they're conditional. And that's my problem right now. I need to see them wake up. I need to see White Knight wake up. I need to see this team stop disrespecting opponents. They snooze their way through groups today. So it's really hard to get a good read on them. But right now, up until they prove to me they're not just asleep and disrespecting opponents, I I, I don't have that much hope for BLG, weirdly. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, what about you, Kira? Where do you land on the uh, how legit a TES at the moment versus BLG, the sleeper TES giant? TES are the best. TES are the best team but the problem is is blg are trying to do the humanoid thing where they like play like morons and then they're gonna go to this tournament and try to instantly like fix everything like i even had this criticism of knight even though i did think he was technically the mvp of spring but not by like like a huge amount i think he edged it out yeah, it's up there, yeah. knight play and playing right now with like such disregard for 
anything. Like his own life, game state. He is for this spring to MSI. He's been playing basically like a maniac, uh, which is fine when it work, like works out on like specific champions that can like match like the tempo and all the team buys into it. You know the the iconic BLG early games, but right now the game isn't really like that. Accelerating the game in the first fifteen minutes, sometimes it's actually better to not risk it and just like farm out the games. And uh, I don't think Knights turned his hand to that um, as well as loads of other like mid laners. The problem is, is if BLG flex into like the anti meta of like not playing like the ADCs. They probably could still just be the best team, but playing what's actually like considered globally the best by the teams, they they right now are like falling like short in the practical sense. The only blessing they kind of have going into this like tournament is they have like a player in Ben who best player in the LPL right now, by the way. Yeah, they 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 have a player in Ben who's just like so absurdly like consistent. Um in any isolated like environment that they might actually just what could it be with threes like they could actually end up like winning games um against opponents that are better than them just because uh ben is given like a platform to like so, play from and talk, the other yeah, people do just share a, up the leaders because again people who don't watch lpl what is it that a player like ben can do or has been doing in lpl that makes so, him dominant I think the easiest way to view it numerically, and I think this is one of the cases where stats do paint a really good picture. In spring, he had the lowest jungle proximity, Shun was never in his lane, and he had the best laning stats despite that. He was winning every single lane harder than anyone else in the league with no jungle intervention. So he was weak side, but he was the strongest top laner. Make that make sense. Um, his team fight impact, absolutely insane. His variety, absolutely insane. Like, you can put him down as far as you want in some games as well, even if he doesn't have that laning impact, and he'll still do the same thing. The guy's just... So, whereas I think Elk and On, very, very bad at being on weak side, they just run into a 2v2 and 2v3 and die. I think that Bin, you can leave him on strong or weak side, and he's perfectly great at both. So, he's just great at everything. The only also, thing you can't do is play Renekton. I think he's alright at that. I don't, like, I prefer him on a list. Mate, no, if, I like if, his, if, no, I like if his If Knight can't play Z or Ben can't play Renekton, nah, there we I go. Like, no, <laughs> no, no, I like his <laughs> No, yeah. he can obviously play, he can play Renekton. I'm saying that I, I don't think you should be picking a player like Ben Renekton. I don't think it's any team fight They're not playing through top lane laning phase like that. That's not what they're uh, Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think it suits them. And, but, yeah. what, but then it comes to top esports. I think the big thing for them is that Tien is on the form of his life right now. If he plays like that, the whole early game revolves around him. He's walked away with early game. He had an early game quadra kill on Lilia around first grub spawn at level four. Um, this guy is absolutely goated at like being able to contest both sides of the map. So he can test dragon and first spawn of grubs, which is typically we see a handshake. One team gets grubs, the other team getting dragon. Um, top esports will fight you at both and quite commonly take both. Um, I think that's Yen. Fantastic. He's the best at mechanically right being in. I think this is the best. I, I think this is the best. Overall, in terms of his game sense and mechanics, all kind of combined into one factor. I think it's the best that Tien has ever played. I think he's that unreal he's, right now. He's, I think that Tien is my MVP right now for LPL. Um, Jackie and Mako, they can do whatever. Cream, he has Shea behind him as a positional coach. That's really helped him in some regards too. He was outlaned by Scout in their series in two out of three games, which is a little. I bit expect that. Possible. Yeah, whatever. But like Cream's been fine. But Tien's the real special part of this team. Three six nine still the god appealed. He'll impact every team fight to a godlike degree. So yeah, I mean, I think I think top esports. If Tien plays how he has in groups, they'll be fantastic. If not, not the shit. <laughs> and this is what's really funny because me and Nymeria like touched on this three, and this is where like, the the whole idea of value. Three six nine might be the most valuable player in the LPL because his he's... team fights, his 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 carries always get free team fights. This guy, yeah, is like ridiculous. I... It's because of like he so uniquely enables like Ben might carry individual like games like like W's on the on the board, but what three six nine conventionally allows you to do in terms of like systems and what he allows people to get away with in terms of their own personal failings of like of like positioning and what he will cover for it's such a floor raiser as in he can have much more flawed players with three six nine and he will like bail them out. And obviously he's got like ruler, like not really. Um, Jackie Love, like, so who's, who's like fantastically like skilled, so it doesn't actually happen as much. But you know what I mean? Like that's why he's like a cheat code to um success uh, in terms of team building in the LPL. Um, even if his like actual individual you know thing might not be as good as someone like Ben. Yeah.
Right, let's uh, end by talking about G2. Now, obviously, the whole G2 mantra this year, let alone this split, has been, you know, we're not just thinking about domestic titles anymore. We're Everything we do is, like, in preparation for... We want to win Worlds, ba basically, right? I know it's the old TSM meme, but they're angling towards being super competitive and being able to win international tournaments, you know, principally Worlds or whatever, and that's been the goal, and that's why they've been, quote-unquote, working on early game or mid game, whatever the fuck. Like, to me, this is not actually There's really always synced. something to work on. Yeah, it's not actually really ever synced up with performances, I've noticed, where I've been like, oh, wow, I can really see they've worked on that. To be honest, I haven't seen that at all really there have been moments this year where i'm like okay yeah g2 is really good at this that or whatever but my question uh to you guys and to you nymera is like do you think like g2 going into um lec playoffs and obviously uh any other matchups indeed do you think they've actually meaningfully improved and what i mean by that i don't mean like obviously you know they came third or whatever in a bunch of bo1s but like are you actually seeing anything in like their gameplay or draft right now that gives you any real confidence that they are currently like a top international team because i think after msi by the way uh, i think it would have been fair to say you know they're probably a top five team in the world like so do, do we feel like they're there at the moment the thing well it's really hard to tell because i've said this before it felt like bb was like the only player playing like a human for a grand majority of the regular split like yeah. this guy was the only person who was still locked in and putting in the day-to-day -day effort and i think I, I think kira brings up a really good point in regards to the problem with the slacking off in regular split style of thought which i do understand to some degree is that you can't magically fix things overnight and if things do crop up it's hard to address them because then they only show up when they're under high pressure scenarios and um in in high level of play the big takeaway from MSI for G2 is that they can contest in lane against top teams. They can. Not always, but they can. Um, and I think against top esports, they, they bluntly beat them through laning, which is not something I ever thought a Western team would do in this era of League of Legends, yeah. which is out lane a top LPL or LCK team into submission. That was not something I expected, especially against the level of um, laning that we had seen from teams like Top Esports when they beat them at MSI. So I haven't seen that level of laning persist into um, regular split. I didn't expect them to be tryharding at lane though. Um, I think BB's been still on really good form. I hope he continues to show that. I think top lane laning phase is, you're not really, there aren't, you can't always force matchups in top lane which allow you to play through winning lane. Twisted Fate sometimes can, Rumble can, but it's not easy to um, get like win lane, win game top lanes right now. A lot of people are handshaking between Skarna, Cassante, stuff like that. Caps has been weird. Um, bot lane hasn't been completely consistent either. And I think because the lanes haven't been consistent, I think Yikes not had himself the best coordinated performances either with them. Um, if they lock in and they end up having really good laning performance, I, I'll feel better about them heading towards worlds. That's like, that's the big thing for me. It's just, I need to see some laning stuff because every, everything outside of that typically for Western teams, it has been decorative if you cannot meet the kind of... Uh, so, uh, my brother Sam had a great phrase, which I keep returning to. You must be this mechanically tall to ride the international roller coaster. You Not cannot... You, you, you cannot lane below a certain par and expect to win games internationally. So, they did that at MSI. That's great. One of the few times where I feel like someone has well and truly cleared that laning barrier. I just need to see that again at some point. And uh, how, how impressed or unimpressed were you with their sort of meta reads? Obviously, something we've talked about t1 in the context of lck being a bit behind we have talked about it with g2 a little bit earlier in the uh, season do you think or in the split rather do you think that g2 their most recent uh performances have shown that they've now got quite a good um, grasp of draft or how do you read it they haven't really been playing towards any ap carries jungle which is a big thing which i'm checking worldwide because i think if genji are doing it and lpl are doing it it's probably the best things we're doing right now. Um, the fact that they haven't really tried—they had what one Zyra game? They even, yeah, they, they won the game. But um, yeah, they've been playing. You know, they've been playing the quirky mid. They've played like a game of Tristana, but like they've played like six, uh, no, like four mage mid games and like a lot of like tanky bruiser initiated jungles. I don't think you can do that right now at the top end of pro play against top teams like consistently i think you can but i don't think it's easy to do it i think that if you go up against like a really good team one of the few teams that can play nidly well or the few teams that are going to be like really punishing you with Carthus, sire or brand um you're, you're going to get absolutely crapped on so that's not got me particularly happy i do like that broken blade is selecting between both tanks and carries top side it's good to have variety there bot lane has been fine um i guess they haven't really done any they haven't played the zigs bot which is i think a big thing or they haven't even played a single game of rumble either actually so yeah. they're not really flexing magic damage options that heavily in bot lane top lane you've got the cannon top side but look it's fine 
I, I think it's fine, and I think they're happy playing the way that they're playing in terms of their early skirmishes and some things around that. I don't love the fact that we're not seeing um, multiple magic damage options across the different roles of the comp, though, because I think that is currently the way that you, you the way that you draft is where am I getting my magic damage from? And because the AP doesn't play really Rumble, good, by the way. Which is a problem. Um, no, I'm, problem. I'm just saying, like, Jen, he yeah. has picked it because he has such a long career. Mm. But in the context of talking about yeah, people playing I mean, things, B B he does not those, play Rumble. BB's one of those players which wouldn't surprise me if he's really been drilling that um, off stage because he did that with Zach, right? Um, it wouldn't surprise me if he's been drilling that to a certain degree of the players that could bring it out of nowhere. Um, but yeah, the fact that they don't have like the Rumble in top lane or even the Mordekaiser, right, which can be a pretty good answer into some stuff, or the Ziggs in bot lane means that you really end up going towards mage mids, which is not always appropriate right now. So I don't love the meta read, but then again, I don't love many meta reads right now outside of LPL and like Genji. Sure. Kira, how playoff slash international ready do you think G2 are at the moment? How good is this version of G2? Yeah. Not very, but like, it's all contextual. You know, it helps that like, you know, T1 don't look as great, which is the team that beat them. But Gen G look impossible. BLG don't look that great. But like TES and GDG actually held that. I thought TES would like would beat them, but it'd be close. I think GDG is actually a horror matchup. That it, MSI it, win uh, series win's going to age really nicely, though. I think or has a chance to beating TES at MSI. That could age very nicely the way TES is going at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like and so you know, I I do think like G two are like a top like team. Um, I, I think they're, they're, this is like a tournament to show it, you know, they've got like a really nice bracket draw, uh, because potentially, uh, let me get this correct, so I'm not absolutely losing my mind, they're going to go like, G oh, they're going to, actually, sorry, I thought they were on to the other side, they're going to run straight into Gen G. So actually, they get a BO3 against Gen G, which is the best place to fight, play Gen G in, because it's the least number of games required to beat them. Um... FlyQuest, I, I expect them to like beat um, Bag M, BO3s, as like ups, are upset prone themselves. It's happened to G2 before in the past. I, I'm just, you know, I say the same thing about them. I think they came out of MSI and into the meta of EU, didn't look that great. I think they looked really far behind uh, Fnatic. I think in the Fnatic game, you actually seen how bad like G2's even like individual like pocket plays and like skirmish plays were, where they, they both teams failed turret dives, for example. Um, and they, they didn't actually have to do anything to beat uh, Fnatic, which is a scary thought. Um, I don't think they've optimally taken to the meta as well as I would hope. Uh, I don't think they've turned their hand to it, but, you know, it's always the whole thing of, like, playoff G2. But I think wrestling on their laurels isn't what you need to be doing because the, the calibre of opponent that you're looking to beat is way beyond like Europe so like you, you want to be like G2 for me wants to be putting in like undefeated seasons in Europe and like but if they aren't the result's still the same if you get it together internationally but it's just a point of like consistency I think I think what's interesting obviously you can talk about different mindsets or whatever but we've talked a lot in LCK stuff about like will Genji go uh, undefeated like will they even drop a single game or whatever I think of course we play best of ones or whatever but it's kind of odd to me that G2 have this and I'm not criticizing this necessarily but they have this kind of attitude of like uh EU's whatever like we'll put in the work and we'll win when we need to but um you know we're not going to go like all out for every second of every day because why bother? And they do tend to drop plenty of games in regular seasons. Whereas Gen G are playing in a much more difficult league and they are going about it in a very sort of ruthless, we are probably going to try and, you know, aggressively win every single series. Um, I do find that slightly problematic i'm not even sure how true it is it could just be the case that g2 really are just not particularly consistent and i'm going to throw out a bit of a prediction now um which is i believe that what's going to happen in these lec playoffs is that bds are going to take g2 to five games in the final i don't i'm not picking them to win i think g2 will probably win but i actually think and by the way, this isn't me saying G2 have regressed loads or anything like that. I think even though I've not been particularly impressed recently, I think they're probably going to be more or less the same team we've seen at MSI slash just before MSI or whatever. But I do actually think BDS 
were a good team before and they have improved and that G2 are just too Ooh. sloppy to be clean in a final my, against my them. My only problem is, is I don't think Labrov's on great form right now. I think that Labrov is like my one like question mark. This guy's been overextending a lot and dying slash not been nailing his engages in the same way. And you can't have a crap support performance versus G2 of all teams. They are very, very good at punishing that. So like, I think... I mean, if yeah, anyone's going to beat them, this is like how oh, no. and poor I think for we... me. I think this is the one of the worst I've actually yeah. seen them yeah, in the, the regular the, I, season. Exactly, that's kind of exactly my point. Mm. I think they are at one of their more vulnerable points, and this and this BDS. And I I agree somewhat with what Nymera is saying that Labrov's been like very just lackadaisical, really. But um, I think mm. that BDS are the strongest challenger they've had this iteration. Um, coupled with the fact that they look a bit vulnerable. Again, I'm still picking G2 to win the split, but I actually think it will be closer than a lot. I, th I think G2 themselves and us, sort of, or the community at large, can be guilty of just assuming that G2 is always going to... It's really, like, it's an old adage, like, people use in combat sports and stuff a lot, but it's like, I do think it is harder to stay at the top than get to the top in some respects, like assuming you have the requisite skill set, right? And it yep. is probably pretty fucking exhausting, uh, you know, the, the monotony of trying to keep everyone comfortably below you for G2. And I do think the BDS are ramping up, but I mean, yeah, we'll see. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, that's going to be it for this week, guys. Uh, we will be back, of course, for playoffs as and when they develop. Um, I, I do, whenever I look at the playoff bracket now in uh, LEC, I do kind of wish it was six teams instead of eight teams because I think we do now have, well, five very interesting teams in Europe. Um, not really sure how a five playoff bracket would work. Maybe you give a bye to the first team or something. Uh, but yeah, so we are going to have a bit of a couple of snoozers, most likely, unfortunately, in the round one. But after that, it should get pretty interesting. Um, so yeah, we will see you all next time.